about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago, OpenAI released ChatGPT into the world. And since then, pretty much every industry has been grappling with what it means, including medicine, obviously. Uh, one of the most tantalizing applications of generative AI has been in diagnostics and treatment, but obviously uh, they carry some of the biggest risks. So we're going to put ChatGPT to the test today, see what it looks like uh, in practice with two diagnostic challenges, and I'm just gonna get right into it. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about our first patient case? Wonderful, thanks Katie. So the first case, um, we have a 64-year-old man who has a fever, repeatedly catching a cold for six days. He felt better after taking some antifebrile agents. Um, but one day before visiting the hospital, had fever, dizziness, headache, all four limbs ache. Um, no cough, shivering, chest tightness, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. He's presenting to the emergency department for evaluation. Um, so Anne, can you talk us through what your top three differential diagnoses would be for this patient? Sure, so this is a 64-year-old gentleman, and we don't have any pest medical history, so we'll assume that otherwise healthy. Um, that's come in with an acute um, duration of symptoms that sound very viral, like systemic symptoms, some respiratory, but I think, I believe it was said no cough or so with that. Um, and so when I think about a differential for this, just trying to think high level, we have to, especially in this thinking viruses most likely, obviously now we'll think uh, SARS-CoV-2, which we know is on the rise again this fall, uh, so COVID-19 being first. But there's a lot of other viruses as well that we know that are starting to tick up as well, flu, RSV, power influenza, human metanumovirus, but I know I haven't been able to read this, but I'm sure unlike ChatGBT, I'm going beyond the three. So I think if I had to say three, I would say COVID-19. I think I would say um, flu. Um, and at this point, I wouldn't say superimposed bacterial inf infection on top of that, and maybe RSV infection. All right. So it's looked like we have ChatGPT with its answers already. Mark, do you want to summarize a little bit of what we have here on the screen? Yeah, so similar, but I'm a little more general for ChatGPT, but pretty darn good. So viral illness or post-viral syndrome, um, we just talked about viral illness. That could be COVID-19, that could be the flu, that could be multiple things. Bacterial infection, again, anytime you have fever, you're thinking of bacterial infection, it could be bacterial pneumonia, sepsis, and other infectious diseases, kind of a catch on So overall, a good start. Does this look like what you've come to expect from answers from ChatGPT so far, or is this a little bit more general than what you typically see, Mark? I think this is, you know, we did a couple studies on this. Um, typically, GPT struggles with the differential um, compared to, to expert clinicians. This is pretty much what we come to expect from it. It's a generalist model, so you get generalist answers. Uh, eventually, we can fine tune these to, to be more specific. But it's interesting, though, right? So even for the bacterial infection, if we're going to say this in someone who's otherwise Again, we have to assume otherwise healthy based on the stem that we have. You would then think, you know, an atypical bacterial infection, perhaps with that onset. What? But there's no cough. There are some other things that there are pertinent negatives that you mentioned that make that seem less likely. And so I think this could be helpful, but it's really just saying what's a fever, exactly. what could cause it, right? Exactly. And you could throw a lot of other things into it as well. And it's nice to note that we do start the answer with, I am not a doctor, which I imagine starts every single one of the yeah. answers from ChatGPT. <laughs> well, I think you said to it, you are a doctor. <laughs> yeah, pretend you're a doctor. But the, the lawyers won't let that happen, so it's fine. Uh, so moving on, and what would you say your, your sort of medical test would be to sort of narrow down your, your differential? So I would want to do viral testing, because I think those are, that's the most likely in this case. And so I'd want to get um, a SARS-CoV-2 uh, test, a, a rapid antigen test, a home test, so you should be able to do rather than having them actually come into the office. If they are, if you're seeing this patient and it's not just a telemedicine visit, then we might as well do an extended respiratory viral panel. And the reason to do that would be because of the fact that the patient is 64. Though you don't know the other medical conditions, we do know those older than 60 do have a higher risk for severity of viral infections. Um, and then if they're there, the, right now there's really no clinical reason that would change things to say you need to get blood work in terms of a CBC or a comprehensive metabolic panel because it's viral. Um, you're not thinking you need to assess for the others. Um, but if there were concern, something concerning on exam, then you'd want to do um, potentially chest imaging um, for that. Yeah. Well, Apparently, ChatGPT wants to do a lot more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, West Nile. Starting with the CBC that you said uh, was totally unnecessary. I, I'm with Anne in terms of what's responsible to order. Um, ChatGPT, basically CBC, so blood count, um, some viral serologies, PCR, that could be your COVID-19 test, for example, of flu. Uh, CBC, CBC, blood cultures. I keep saying COVID-19, but it doesn't say COVID-19. Is that because the training model is too old? 
No, it, this actually has internet access, except it's, it's not going to stick. This is not very good to get yeah. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think it's, it's a Dan generous model. Dan saying, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> this is job security. Um, by the way, I'm not affiliated with OpenAI. I could care less if this is good or not. Um, but I do study it, and I, I, so that's why it's interesting to me. Um, blood cultures, so chest x-ray, which we, we both got chest x-ray, great. C-reactive protein, a measure of inflammation, okay. Um, you know, and then Lyme serology, dang, West Nile, and then, you know, do a head CT. So the rest of this stuff is kind of like, if you had unlimited money and time, what would you order? Um, well, but I also think it's about, right, the iterative process, sure. right? So like, this would be back and forth. It seems like what this is giving you the answer of, if you're really concerned and you will have to, you only have one snapshot to yeah. get lab tests, to get imaging, to get this, this would be the kitchen sink that you'd be getting. Totally agree, totally agree. So this is not how we would practice medicine necessarily, but it's, it's a flawed interpretation of how we would do it. <laughs> What's your final guess after your information from the well, we, test comes and, back? And I will, Let's pull up the actual. Oh, we haven't gotten it. We have information, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a couple of medical tests. We have an x-ray, um, so this is what we got. Oxygen saturation of 92%, white blood cell count, count is a little high. Procalcitonin, procalcitonin, sorry, is high. Um, and our chest x-ray is attached. Those are the most relevant tests we got. So I think seeing this chest x-ray, you have here that it's clearly that it's a, a multifocal, diffuse, um, uh, really a pacifications all throughout the lungs, which is very classic for viral um, syndrome. Other things can cause this, non-infections, um, such as diffuse alveolar hemorrhage can cause this, a pneumocystis in the right patient, none of which those last two things would pertain to this um, case. So really viral, this supports that. There's nothing here to suggest a consolidative large opacity for a bacterial process. Couldn't a typical pneumonia, a typical bacterial be this? Definitely, um, you know, this can be a lot of things on a chest x-ray, but again, still viral, viral, viral when I see this. The interesting thing is the pro-cal level. Um, we know that that's 0.4, it's positive, but it's not very high. And so it's definitely not the level we would think it would be for bacterial infection. Um, we know in COVID it helps us a bit because we expect it to be you know, low normal positive and it helps us also with the severity of infection. And in this case, um, the patient does not seem to be very sick. So just reading, so exactly right. So the, the diagnosis uh, answer is COVID-19. For this one, it's a common diagnosis. We would say, you know, what's nice about GPT is it actually does pretty well on reading the chest. So as a radiologist, I might say this in the ED, if you come to MGH. Um, and then it integrates the rest of it for pneumonia. You know, it doesn't say COVID-19 pneumonia, it doesn't say get a COVID PCR. Again, so close, around it, not necessarily very specific or accurate. So. I mean, I would say we, we don't yet know which viral this is. Like, so to me, it's very, still very hard mm -hmm. to say that, I would say this makes me confirm that this is most likely viral. This would not be a reason that I would give antibiotics to this um, patient, and, but I would definitely want to get a SARS-CoV-2 test because they would have, the, have implications. That's one of the viruses, such as flu as well, that we have treatment for, and so that would change that, and I think we would need to get those tests before we get some of these other lab work. Awesome. Uh, well, we have a slightly more complex case up next. Uh, Mark, can you summarize this one for us? Yeah, I'll try. Um, so this is a 57-year-old admitted for progressive respiratory failure and fever. He's got multiple myeloma. He's undergoing his first cycle of multiple therapies as his seventh line of treatment. Five years earlier, he had a stem cell transplant, had some complications, including a fungal infection, had multiple previous lines of therapies, which I won't go through specifically. Um, he was treated uh, per normal schedule for dexamethasone for more than 10 months. Um, last, deratumumab infusion occurred 40 days before admission. He's no longer receiving secondary mold active prophylaxis at this time, and no graft versus host disease. So a complex case. Yeah. I love this case, because this is a much where I focus on transplant oncology, infectious diseases, and so there's a lot here that have given us in the first case we didn't really have. It could be so general, but here, I think what's really important before we get to the differential is this kind of how do we summarize this? And really what we think about this is how do you describe this host, this patient, right? The first case, all we knew was that it was an individual older than 64. Here we know, I forget the age of this individual, but that this is essentially relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, has gone through multiple lines of treatment. And what's important is always to think about which of these treatments, at least from my perspective as an infectious disease doctor, which of these treatments have implications with certain, putting them at greater risk for certain infections. 
And so some of the things that stand out is we know they had a stem cell transplant, assuming this is um, uh, an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Uh, and then now, most recently, been on dexamethasone, which is very common in our myeloma patients, high doses usually for a long period of time, here 10 months. Um, and then daratumumab. So daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody targeting CD38. In and of itself, it doesn't have specific increase in infectious risks. It's not one of those like an anti-CD20 or other ones that you would think, okay, you hear this, they're on this, you need to make sure it's not X, Y, and Z. But we do know that this, these patients that are on daratumumab do tend to have higher risk of infections. But I think it's usually multifactorial because these are patients that have already gone through multiple treatments and it's really the road traveled by that patient. And often these patients can be lymphopenic, neutropenic, and be at risk for bacterial and viral infections. And so if you're gonna ask me to kind of cut to the What's chase now. <laughs> so yes. I would say some of the things that are missing from the stem that would be important to know is whether or not the patient is on pneumocystis prophylaxis, given the duration of steroids that the patient's been on. Because if not, pneumocystis pneumonia would be first, second, and third for me at this point. <laughs> um, and so that would be very important to know. If they're on PCP prophylaxis, then I think in this, this is a patient that ordinarily I wouldn't have said fungal infection is next highest on my list, but this patient had a prior fungal infection and is no longer on an antifungal for prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis after the fact and is still now getting blasted with immunosuppression. And so fungal infection, and then to be more specific with that, we know that aspergillus is one of our most common uh, fungal infections. We see this cryptococcus also a possibility um, and um, well, pneumocystis is also a fungal infection, but we've covered that. And then we'd think about other things in terms of other bacterial or um, viral things, non-infectious wise, and pneumonitis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So pneumocystis pneumonia, a fungal infection, could be aspergillus, could be cryptococcus, and then bacterial viral. Is your third? Generally? Yeah, I would kind of group in because yeah. these patients are always at risk for bacterial and viral infections. Awesome. Yeah. Um, again, a really complex case. We, we got some general diagnoses from GPT, bacterial, viral, or fungal, especially mold. It, it really did hone into the fact that there's no anti-mold prophylaxis um, right now. Disease progression itself, so they're saying multiple myeloma can progress itself and cause these uh, complications, including the respiratory complications, and then perhaps ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and then some non-infectious um, pulmonary complications. Uh, bronchiolitis, obliterans, or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, so bleeding in the lungs, essentially what GPT said. Again, sort of predictable generalities here from what you've seen, Mark? Yep, yep, I but totally I'm, agree. I'm surprised though, right? Because it goes through and it tells you, it picks up on the fact that it's not on anti-mold or antifungal treatment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pick up on the road traveled by the patient, which I would think of as, at least as a clinician, that's where this could be helpful. Right. If I didn't remember the daratumumab was a monoclonal antibody against CD38 and what, it, what is it associated with infectious risk-wise, I'm surprised that it doesn't give us that. Yeah. Um, so how would you start to narrow it down here? <laughs> You're like, get to the chase. Well, so, <laughs> I'm it's a complex case. Obviously, Absolutely. you have hours and hours so, to think about this, but I've, I've, you have eight so, minutes. No, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so what I would first like is serum fungal markers. I would like a glucan. That would help us with pneumocystis. It will also help us with our fungal infections. A galactomannan, which is more specific for aspergillus um, in terms of fungal infections. A serum cryptococcal antigen. Um, a CBC will be important to know if this patient is neutropenic um, or how severely lymphopenic the patient could be. And then this is definitely a patient that I would get chest imaging and I would like a CT chest rather than just doing a chest x-ray. Mm -hmm. Once again, I'm definitely not a doctor. It was reminding us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before it starts, uh, again, it orders a lot of tests. As a radiologist, I'm good with the chest x-ray and chest CT being up front. Um, and then the, the galactomannan, right? So it did hone in on the fact that this, this might be fungal, and that was one of the key tests um, that Anne mentioned. Um, of course, a lot of other tests, bronchial alveolar lavage, sputum culture, gram stain that we may or may not get, not necessarily right away, but perhaps later on. Um, so again, a lot of tests, some of them the same. Would any of this be useful to you as a clinician to see it laid out in such broad Absolutely, terms? I will say this to me, compared to the first case is much on point, much better on point. Mm -hmm. um, like I didn't mention LDH, and LDH would be very helpful in this case if we're worried about pneumocystis um, as well. And so I think this is, and it lays it out pretty nicely in mm -hmm. that regard. So I think this one is a lot more aligned with what are the, also because of the complexity of the patient. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if that aligns with sort of the trends that you've seen, Mark, in running through cases. Do you find that, you know, more subspecialty care results in better 
recommendations from ChatGPT? I think it's the more, the, the more info that's in the question stem and the prompts, the better it performs. And so you can run these prompts yourself. On, that was one of the cool things that's accessible. So you can take some cases and say 54-year-old comes with shortness of breath and it'll give you a differential. But then you can say 54-year-old with shortness of breath, um, pitting edema in the legs, um, pacemaker, or something like that. And it may be more specific in the differential it gives you. Um, so it's, it's very prompt dependent. I would say that goes for medicine as well as in, in general the use of GPT in industry. Mm -hmm. So let's give both of them. All right. So points. the relevant medical tests have been completed. These are select tests. Some of them are being withheld, but a lymphocytopenia, um, but a normal neutrophil count, low immunoglobulin levels, normal renal function, no anemia, elevated CRP, that general inflammation marker, serum cryptococcal antigen is negative, some basic heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen sat, 94%. And we got the chest CT. So remember, these are just selective tests. We're not giving them everything. And the chest CT magnified for Anne is right here. So this is helpful, right? Because we know the patient's not neutropenic. It's lymphopenic, which, which we would expect in the myeloma patient. Um, the serum CRAG is negative, so we just know it's less likely to be cryptococcus. Um, but the, really, the key thing is this chest imaging, showing here the um, bilateral multifocal ground glass opacities you see in the right upper lobes. Um, a lot of ground glass opacities, and then you see some more nodular formations throughout, and then the left lower lobe, and I guess in the right lower lobe there too, a more of a consolidative opacity with some surrounding ground glass. And that's a classic teaching for that being concerning for fungal infection. It's not diagnostic at all, but it is very suggestive of that, particularly in this host. And so based on that, I'd be much more concerned then for a fungal infection. Yeah. This is kind of remarkable to me, seeing this <laughs> in real time, almost using some of the same terminology that you are. Um, Mark, can you talk us through some of the uh, you know, image-based analysis that's going on here and how yeah. that works? Yeah, absolutely. So, so exactly what, I'll let it play out, um, but exactly what Anne was saying is these are very specific um, signs that you can see in invasive mold uh, infections. Um, you know, the, the solid nodules are due to occlusion of blood vessels creating little infarcts. And the ground glass, what we say, this kind of translucent, not black for air in a CT, but not necessarily white for bone, this kind of middle is, is hemorrhage around these nodules. And it's called something specific, which Anne picked up, but GPT also picked up, called the halo sign. You read any chest, uh, you read any radiology textbook, it specifically will mention this. Um, so it, it seems that GPT has read this, and that is a specific, we call it Aunt Mini, um, diagnosis is, is locked, it's invasive aspergillosis. So. I would disagree with the radiologist say the diagnosis is not locked. It is I wouldn't say it on my report. The bacterial would... process <laughs> could be that way <laughs> um, or whatnot, but yes, it does mean that, but it, it's, all this really means, right, is this isn't diagnostic for aspergillus per se. It says that it puts pneumocystis much lower, it puts uh, mold much higher, aspergillus is being more common, and with having a negative cryptococcal antigen there um, with it, but could it be a fusarium? Could it be a Scytosporium? Yes, still with that, but I would still say aspergillus and what they're saying, this all seems much more aligned. I'm really shocked by this outcome, <laughs> honestly. I thought that ChatGPT would be excellent in the simple case of COVID-19 and it definitely wouldn't get this, but we've seen kind of the opposite. Thank you so much for doing this experiment with us, for being our guinea pig, and, you, and we'll see you all at cocktails. Thank, Thank you. you.